to. Thanks, everybody, for coming in this evening. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure, of course, and real delight to be able to launch what will be a short but quite focused uh, public program the beginning weeks of this term here at the AA, uh, and to launch that, of course, with a return visit by Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. Um, the event this evening coincides, by the way, with the launch of a delightful new book that we've just published called Having Words, uh, a selection of a dozen essays by Denise Scott Brown, which this lecture tonight uh, will help launch. Uh, and I want to invite you all to join us after the lectures by Bob and Denise uh, immediately next door in the South Jury Room, where we will be selling copies and, of course, we'll be encouraging you to get downstairs to the bookshop for the next few weeks while these valuable little yellow books remain to get your copy um, here at the AA. Uh, the book is the fourth installment in a series we launched a year ago called AA Words, whose explicit purpose is to return writing and thinking to architectural culture in almost its most traditional form, the printed page. Uh, I can think of no other individual in the world today uh, who embodies that, amb that ambition uh, than Denise Scott Brown, uh, who has been writing for over 40 years on architecture and its relationship to culture, planning and other disciplines and proves herself an absolute master of the essay as a built architectural form. Uh, as she writes uh, in the afterword to this book, I have come to feel like a grandmother in architecture, she says. Uh, I am a guardian of its institutional memory and I'm someone who knows both its pitfalls and where all of the bodies are buried. <laughs> Uh, it's just one of, I think, countless gems you'll find packed into the 12 essays making up the book, which Tom Weaver in the A Print Studio Next Door has played a huge part uh, in bringing to life in the past few weeks and months. Uh, tonight we have the privilege of enjoying a return to the AA of Denise uh, and her partner, Robert Venturi, who visit the school for the first time in a great many years, uh, and really for the first time since the famous episode and event of the building of the Sainsbury Wing of the National Gallery completed in the early 1990s. To remind an AA audience, that event, of course, is famous for it having been brought to fruition by one AA graduate working with her partner, uh, following a famous row by Prince Charles with a project proposed by another AA graduate and his partners, who in turn had been critiqued um, for having followed too closely the modernist beliefs of yet a third shortlisted AA project by Lord Rogers, which was almost nearly realized on the site a quarter century ago. Given that that attack by Prince Charles was of course made when he at the time was the son of the patron of the AA, Her Majesty the Queen, I think it's fair to say that debates between history and modernism are sometimes more family affairs than many people are willing to admit. <coughs> All of that said, I think what's important to mention for our students tonight is that what Bob and Denise will be showing is the latest results of projects and work that in fact began in some form in this very building. More than half a century ago, Denise Scott Brown arrived in London and at the AA in I believe 1952 for two years of work in the diploma school prior to her graduation in 1954 for a thesis design project um, delivered for Arthur Korn on the planning of a Welsh mining town at that time. Uh, following the advice of Korn uh, here in the school and, and other individuals in London, particularly Peter Smithson, who she met in her brief stay here, uh, she was counseled to move on to Philadelphia, which in fact she did in applying to the University of Pennsylvania, where she soon met her future husband, collaborator, and partner, Robert Venturi. Uh, and they've told me the story a couple of years ago of them meeting at a faculty meeting at University of Pennsylvania, uh, which was held explicitly for the purpose of saving a glorious university library built by the Philadelphia architect Frank Furness, and I think they were the only two faculty members supporting it, and it is undoubtedly the most famous faculty meeting of architecture schools of the last several decades. <coughs> Tonight's visit uh, by Bob Venturi is about 61 years after his first visit to London, which he came to for the first time in 1948, 
while he was completing his MFA project at Princeton University, which he delivered in 1950, in which he assimilated for the first time projects in places like London, Rome, and other European cities to set the template for a body of work and research that unfolded in forms that, of course, many of you know already in books like His Complexity and Contradiction, published 15 years later in 1966. I don't think anyone in this audience needs a summary of all of the great accomplishments, prizes, and awards, which include medals of honor, Pritzker prizes, honorary professorships, an opportunity to work with some of the world's great clients and many other things. What I thought I would just mention are three of the obvious larger themes that I think all of architecture culture uh, provides the context for the great achievement of these two architects. The first one surely is the idea in the latter half of the 20th century that architecture is a form of communication. And what we're being visited by tonight, of course, are two absolute masters of architectural communication, the dozens of languages that their books appear in worldwide confirms. Um, a second great theme, of course, is that of design research. In a very short span of three years in the 1960s, Bob and Denise effectively invent the idea of a contemporary design research studio, which they do in New Haven right at the end of the 1960s in a series of famous visits that take them and their students first to New York and Times Square, then to Las Vegas, and finally to Levittown and in fact lay out the principles for the idea of learning design by learning about the world outside the studio. And a topic, of course, that makes their work today incredibly important and relevant to a new generation of architects. I think the third great theme, and one that's rarely referred to when talking about their work, is of course their work as partners. I think Denise and Bob are absolutely the most remarkable partnership as architects that we can imagine over the last century in architectural culture. These are two great individual and original thinkers and doers of architecture, and I think one of the great ironies of that fact, of course, is that it's unfolded in close collaboration and partnership and discussion and debate between them over 40 or more years. Uh, <coughs> just to say before, before briefly uh, welcoming Bob to the lectern, that this event tonight will be followed tomorrow morning by an open seminar that we'll be holding with Bob and Denise in which they'll get an opportunity to present some of their recent projects as an application to the theories and ideas they'll be talking about tonight. You all, of course, are welcome to that. Uh, we'll have a group of critics in the building in addition to them and our staff and students to discuss their work, to engage in open conversation and do something their work has long proven exceptional for, which is provoking conversations and debates. Um, uh, a final point to just mention, we will in about a week's time, two weeks' time, I think it's on Friday the 15th of May, uh, we will be inviting in Martino Stierley who will be showing films that were shot by Bob and Denise as a part of their Las Vegas visit in the 1960s, uh, as a part of the research that I think didn't quite make it into the book, but in fact was an incredibly important part of the work and the way in which they were looking uh, at that city at that time. Please join me first in welcoming Bob Venturi, who will do a short talk, he tells me, and then pass over to Denise Scott Brown. What's yours? Yeah. Right. Yes, anyway. There's water here if you'd like. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think. Do I have to talk into anything, or is that. You can hear me? Can you hear me all right? I'm talking like this. Okay, I thank you for that most uh, generous and gracious uh, uh, introduction. I should mention that we are disdained by a lot of people, and if you're really good, you're not totally popular. So I do want to emphasize that we are not totally accepted, certainly haven't been and are not now. That makes me feel more comfortable. Um, I will. Um, I love, I love coming to London. I love London. I love English architecture and uh, the mannerist quality that has been. Architecture. Architecture. Part of the architecture from uh, way back. Can you hear me back there? Not too well? All right. Can he? Can he? Oh. All right. Okay. 
Um, this is really a Denise Scott Brown occasion. Uh, I've been introducing the last four or five days, days as Mr. Thatcher. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I am accompanying Denise essentially, and so her lecture is going to be longer and uh, more related to the issues that we're emphasizing tonight. Um, but. Um, And, but I would like to, um, to refer in these few minutes I'm going to talk, I have about 20 slides, I'm going to go through quickly. I'm going to uh, refer to uh, and, and talk about, um, her subject is going to be uh, what she calls towards an active soci socioplastics. I'm not quite sure what that means. but. <laughs> Uh, and mine is going to be more. Again. Okay, I'm talking, saying something, I'm saying something, I'm saying. Sounds good. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. No idea. Um, And that is, it's bad again. Oh my God, I said there's only going to be five minutes. No, it's going to be. No, it's going to be minutes. 10 minutes of setup. Yeah, sure. Try that. Hi. That better? No. That better? Okay, good. Okay. Now, it's, it's, this is not irrelevant in that architecture in the last 20 years or so, the modern architectural theorists have been emphasizing architecture from the standpoint of space, and that's appropriate. Space is essential space, space, space definition of architecture, uh, and also um, um, essentially, a, let's say, a, a space. And they have been not mentioning uh, the uh, other elements, and one of them uh, is uh, within the Vitruvian the elements. Uh, uh, one of them is, um, uh, the, uh, is ornament, uh, is symbolism, is reference, is architecture as an way of information. And we think this is especially appropriate now for what is referred to as our information age. And this also allows us to use not just old-fashioned now um, industrial uh, technology. We still use it. It is still appropriate, but it is not the tech new or the exciting technology of now but the, with the, the, the technology of electronics and digital uh, methods. Um, so I'm going to show a kind of series of slides, I call it a kind of potpourri of different kinds of, of images relating to this idea of reminding us of the, 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 the essence, the, the significance and the continuing uh, quality uh, of, arch of, uh, of symbolism and ornament as part of architecture. Uh, and, that is, uh, and that is architecture that is telling you something besides giving you expressive spatial aesthetic qualities. And there are obvious elements. We are, this, is, of course, is a, mod a 20th century version of a classical building in Philadelphia, a Greek building. Uh, but it does, it does indicate what they, they were telling us at the time, the historians, uh, that that sculpture, that that sculpture was, um, uh, was, was that ornamental sculpture was uh, employed color. And you have hieroglyphics on the Greek architecture to the, on the Egyptian, arch, uh, Egyptian architecture, ancient, uh, 
architecture to the right or hieroglyphics or writing, so to speak, is all over the buildings, on the columns, on the walls, all over, giving out information. And then you have the, um, uh, the architecture of the later periods of the early Christian church uh, and of the um, Byzantine, uh, where you have uh, usually uh, the, the medium of uh, mosaics, uh, which are, again, giving you out information. And we look at that essentially as art today, but it is only secondarily art, I think it could be argued, was there essentially to give out information to a populace that could not read uh, and that was being taught, or in the, let's say in the Gothic, in the uh, Baruch period, kind of being trying to keep them in to remain Roman Catholics rather than to become Protestants. So that, but it did have this, this quality. And by the way, it was done in an artful way, so it was also art. And this uh, is, is, was, was a part of me, the medium within the great styles of architecture since the classical period. Next slide, please. Uh, and then we have the Gothic stained glass windows, which we think of highly as art. They are incidentally art, but each one of those uh, elements is telling you a specific story about Christianity uh, and uh, informing uh, the, um, uh, the, the populace. And then, of course, on the other side, you have, again, the Byzantine period, and that being done not by stained glass, but by the medium of mosaics. Next slide. Uh, you have the... the, uh, the um, <clears throat> the facade of the Gothic uh, building, again, we think of highly as art. It is art, but also uh, each of those um, uh, uh, statues within each of those niches uh, is telling you a story about different saints uh, and, uh, and kind of relating them to each other via their position in terms of certain hierarchical hierarchies of importance. Um, and then you have to the right uh, the book, which is wonderful, the place as narrative against, against again, this, involving this idea of these uh, renaissance, in this case, uh, um, elements uh, that are on a wall uh, that are informing you and teaching you. Next slide. As well as decor, decor being ornamental on the left, uh, the interior. Uh, uh, Baroque, uh, which is trying to wham you with the with the uh, whammo quality that, um, that this arch this uh, uh, religion could uh, could uh, have, and then of course there are these wonderful buildings. I adore Elizabethan and Jacobean architecture uh, in England, and where lots of lots of it does have that latter. This is better, isn't it? I don't know. Uh, lots of lots of it does have. Uh, um, uh, writing uh, has writing on it, uh, as in these um, manor houses. Next slide, so other examples. Uh, this uh, the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and on that wall, as you get up close, you can read over a thousand names of great uh, literary, uh, literary, uh, uh, historical uh, uh, um, persons in, in the history. Up until then, and on the bottom, you have other information given by a new medium, uh, uh, giving you information concerning the stock market uh, in uh, New York, in Manhattan. Next, uh, I love comparing the, um, the uh, uh, Times Square and uh, St. Mark's Square, and I call Times Square the St. Mark's of today, uh, but again, uh, more specifically with Times Square, but also with St. Mark's, there is a good deal, again, of information given, of message giving. The one on the lower, of course, is one trying to convince you to uh, advertise and convince you to, convincing you to buy. Next slide, other indications. There's Main Street on the left, the typical Main Street in the West in America, where there are signs along Main Street. There are, in the upper one, Main Street, uh, 
of today, we're in a more modest way. Signs are very important. And on the right, the particular uh, direction of architecture in uh, the Soviet Union in the, I think it was early 20s of the last century, where again, signage was part of the aesthetic. Very different from the Western uh, international style architecture, which did not use signage so much beginning in the Bauhaus. Next slide. Uh, again, Main Street of today. Signs, signs, signs for the information age. This is my, my favorite building in Manhattan on uh, 7th Avenue at 50th. It's a building by SOM, kind of an ordinary building. Art. KPM. Hmm? KPM? Yeah. KPM? Oh, goodness. I'm glad you told me that. SOM might sue me for having said that. Um, <laughs> Cohen, Pedersen, and Fox. Uh, and where there is specific uh, moving information uh, going along those uh, three parts of that wall, or sometimes it's ornamental pattern, sometimes it's information concerning the stock market, sometimes it's information uh, which is advertising trying to sell you something. It is absolutely dynamic, dramatic, and at a level that you can see it as you pass it uh, in a taxi going down. 7th Avenue torn towards Times Square. Next slide. Um, there is, of course, the Ginza on the left, uh, which Japan is really, really good at this. Uh, and uh, Ginza is just, again, uh, and on the, on the right is a, is a particular building, the Ginza, uh, when the building is essentially made up of signs. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, um, its um, facade is signs that go across the, uh, the uh, balconies. Um, next slide is just to remind us what it has been and possibly still is all the rage now on the left, uh, where there's not signage and where architecture is designed. Uh, this does exist, of course, also with the high art is art which wouldn't, where you, they wouldn't be caught dead having words, signs, and they use these dynamic um, um, uh, forms or else structural expose on the upper left um, uh, to uh, g give the aesthetic. But I think that's not really what this age is going to be, is going to be appreciated for. It's not really that interesting, at least boring to me. And then I just have on the right the famous um, Long Island Duckling, uh, which is the opposite of that. Next slide, just some more uh, American slides. The one on the right, of course, is Times Square. And then they have the billboards, the American billboards. I like to say that American billboards, which are disdained today by Americans, although they're all over the place, I like to say that they're going to be considered very essential, dynamic, uh, pop, uh, popular, low art, if you will, uh, of our time, and they will be hanging in in craft museums a century from now. There will be a billboard on the wall next to a um, what do you call it, Denise? A quilt. A quilt. A quilt. A, quilt. a handmade quilt. They will, they, will be, they will be considered equivalently important as, uh, as elements. And there's another billboard. Next slides. There's the great PSFS building, Philadelphia Saving Fund Society building in Philadelphia. The city I grew up in, it was built around 1928, and I was very young. And I loved that building and still do. Uh, and fortunately, it's, it's been maintained. It's by Howe and Lescaz, Lescaz being a Swiss architect. And um, that building, again, is one where signage is very much part of the aesthetic. And then there's this other kind of commercial, uh, which is very much uh, on the American scene. N that was designed uh, more or less for uh, the uh, McDonald's by uh, uh, Stephen Eisenhower in our office. Next slide. 
this is another sign of billboards that we designed when we were designing that Philadelphia was uh, anticipating having a World's Fair. It never happened in 1976. And on, on the right is a, 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 paint, a, a representation of a famous painting. I forget who it is. The Philadelphia Museum of Art, famous uh, Baroque painting, French. And on, on the left is that one having uh, a signage uh, depicting uh, what's, what are called um, a particular kind of sandwich, Philadelphia hoagie, which Philadelphia is uh, famous for. Next slide. Uh, there is a uh, Basco, it's a building we designed where we built a loft, which made a lot of sense for varying functions going on inside over time. To be seen by the, uh, from the, um, uh, uh, from the co moving car on the left, and then across the parking lot, which is extremely important, and then BASCO. This building lasted about two or three years, and then it was torn down as considered outrageous and ugly by the highfalutin people in the suburban area. This is our building board, which is a building um, with a big billboard on it for a, a museum uh, dedicated to football. It's a football hall of fame. And in the back there is a kind of continuing place where you have a kind of nave. Uh, when you're on the ceiling, you have, I think there's a picture coming up of it, of, of, um, of um, Baseball, football, football players painted on the ceiling, kind of the equivalent of saints painted on the ceiling of churches, uh, on goth of um, Baroque churches. And then on the outside there is the billboard where you could sit from your car and watch the uh, an indication of the game that's going on maybe at that Saturday afternoon. Next slide. Uh, there's the interior of the Football Hall of Fame. There are the Baroque football players up above. This is a building we designed, or a few buildings we're designing, I'm showing uh, now, uh, in uh, Toulouse, France, uh, where you really have to know the context better to understand that this is, does fit in with the context of the gr beautiful Greek, a uh, uh, brick city of Toulouse, with those columns there. there those columns uh, did exist uh, as, as uh, real columns uh, uh, that were gave you an indication of an entrance to the city. And, whether you, and then we, uh, we kind of represented them by making them flat and having them on the, the front. Next slide. This is our um, approach, the ferry, Manhattan Ferry Terminal, where you would approach Manhattan across uh, the river, uh, and you would see um, the three places for the ferry boats to, um, uh, to um, enter. Uh, and then the, the facade was like a facade, uh, the facade was like a sign, uh, kind of indicating American flag and giving moving information concerning uh, things going on in Manhattan at the time. This facade only lasted about two years. It was torn down because it was considered vulgar. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, this is a building um, that some of you here would notice, would be familiar with, and there we, unfortunately, it has now in front of a great big horrible banners hanging in front of it, uh, but it's really not related to what I'm saying, but it does, it does uh, become a building that is separate from the building next to it, the Sainsbury Wing versus the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, National Gallery, the main building of the 1840s or 50s, uh, and uh, we employ uh, literally the column and uh, pilasters of the former building, but we make the rhythm different. The, 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 the rhythm is complex on the original building, but it's a kind of the rhythm of a gavotte or a, that kind of rhythm, and this is a rhythm that's jazzy, and but it also is uh, arranged so that the building inflects toward the original building. So you see this building as kind of evolving from the older building, and this building would not make any sense if it were alone because it is inflecting toward the other building. Fortunately, the Sainsbury's like this, and we went ahead with it. This is a famous uh, Best Products 
design building we did, this building was demolished uh, also. Uh, and four of these panels are now going to hang in the uh, Albert, the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, <laughs> here in London. Next slide. These are two high rises we did. Unfortunately, they aren't going to get built because for certain reasons, uh, for Shanghai. And we have here again explicit ornament uh, on the outside. They are they are again the archi the architecture does not der get its uh, let's call it sexiness its aesthetic quality from being dramatic uh, uh, form um, geometric form, but but it is a, a a normal kind of sensible loft dash. Uh, high rise allowing for flexibility inside, but on the exterior this there is this ornament and again there is inflection between the two buildings and the old building and some indication up above of, of a Chinese uh, thing. This is, uh, we're getting near the end, this is a um, other building uh, which is a um, another kind of building where the building is is, or is, a, is a just a kind of typical building. It is a ch a, a, an addition to a to a um, hospital in uh, rural Pennsylvania, but there is a big H in front of it to stand for the H word, hospital. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and it's just sort of emphasizing that we're not doing this. And I'm a great admirer of Le Corbusier, but Le Corbusier V ready is would not really rely on signs whatsoever. It would be a pure new, a pure new uh, urban uh, complex. And this is the, 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 for, for, the, for Paris in the distance you see the, that, but then occasionally Saint-Denis at the top and the uh, other uh, Parisian historical buildings are still there. Uh, but uh, what he did was separate and not integrated into and then there's a big highway, and again, no signs along the highway in the Le Corbusian um, urban complex. Next slide. Okay. This is the last one uh, where there is a, uh, this is a famous painting in America called, the one on the left is the original one called The Architect's Dream. And I forget the name of the painter, darn it. But, um, it is the, the architect sitting on the top of the column uh, and looking out and seeing all of the great buildings of the past uh, that he admires so much, that we admire so much, that I admire so much, that he has uh, assembled. Uh, and then on the right, Stephen Eisenhower went and just added other kinds of buildings that could be included. So that here is form and symbol. On the other side is a balance between high culture and pop culture. So there is the Shell and the McDonald's in there, along with uh, the Renaissance and Gothic uh, masterpieces. And we like to think that we should recognize the everyday pop culture that is vital, just as the European Bauhaus architects around 1910, who then came to America soon and adapted um, the uh, American, the American industrial vernacular. They made their buildings look like beautiful factories. They did a beautiful thing. Now, is it not appropriate to be inspired by the American commercial vernacular that does make for these combinations of elements that do include signage and symbolism? Um, so that's that, <coughs> and um, this is sort of what we're known for. Denise is now going to talk more, more appropriately about what we're not known for, but which is appropriate in our approach and which we think is uh, significant for today for architecture and architectural designers. Thank you. How can people from Bob's lecture come to the conclusion that all we care about is neon? <laughs>
But one of the reasons I'm here is to tell you that that's not true. But you could see from the talk itself it's not true because there's a very broad view of communication that he gave in a brief time. Um, on the other hand, he makes the point, and I make the point, that um, when we work in the office, 90% of the time we talk about other things. And one of my aims is to show us as we really are, not hell-bent on neon no matter what, and also not um, sitting in the laps of American corporate structure. Why that is um, thought in England um, has to do with the how we came here under whose auspices. Um, that same Mrs. Thatcher and um, a corporation supporting a, a public institution and um, a prince treading on everyone's toes. So that somehow has got translated to us doing um, the work of American corporations. We don't have that kind of work. We mainly work for universities. Um, now you can have an arcane argument that they are the corporate structure and another, and I might not disagree with you to some extent, but it really is not a very direct connection. And um, so, as I said, although we stress communication when we talk very often, when we design, we have many other things in our minds. And um, some of these other ideas which are so basic to our work um, and help us do our main job, which is architecture, help us to do it in a different way. And it's that that I really want to describe. Um, now, my thinking has a lot of sources. I've happened to be educated in three countries, and in each of them, just as social upheavals happened. So it was South Africa in the 1940s as the nationalist government took over, England after World War II as the socialist ideas were very preponderant and as there was huge social change. Then when I got to America in 1958, I said, what's wrong here? The students are so quiet. Um, and within two years, of course, they weren't. So um, I think I've learned a great deal from all of this, but the sources of my thinking are therefore threefold, and they start in Africa. Next slide, please. Um, these are very old slides. That, um, they were taken in the 1950s. Um, the top right-hand corner is the house I grew up in. So how can I be anti-early modernist when I remember the blueprints of that house from the age of about two? And um, my mother had studied architecture. And if you go to the um, one of the oeuvre complete by Le Corbusier, you see him writing to a group of South African students. And he says, um, can't you find a very rich person in Johannesburg who can bring me out there to talk with you and maybe we can do a project together? He wasn't interested in lecturing the way we are. He wanted to work with these people. Well, my mother was one of the group, and um, she dropped out after two years. But her friends who were in touch with Le Corbusier um, designed that house for her. My father kept saying, what is this? Um, but then we all loved it. And if you think you can't be mythic about early modernism, the two-year-old, well, the, I was about four when we moved in, who knew that house can tell you you can. You can play on the flat roof. You can play ships on that balcony. You can climb up the columns there. Um, the the um, slot windows allow a listening place between um, my, our room and my mother's room. Um, what we didn't have was the attic stairs and the dormer windows. And I did miss those, but there was a lot for the imagination there. And I've been a great lover of early modernism ever since, since then. It was also uh, early modern furniture designed by refugees in South Africa. So that's one side. Now the other side is there's no child in South Africa who did not grow up knowing about this. Now how am I going to, which way does this one work? That way, there. Um, 
in a warm climate, you live out of doors. The hens with you and the cooking here. Look at these very beautiful structures. Um, this is the road. Think of the expressways that lead to Levittown, and here's the road. It's the cow path that's made famous in American mythology about the origins of Boston. Well, there are cow paths all over here, but there's no road because it's a, it's not a, um, it's not a trading society. It's a subsistence society. Next. And here you see that again. Look where the road is, and then some cow paths down to the water. The family structure and the the clan structure shown very clearly over here. It's a subsistence economy, except not really, because the men went to work in the city so that they could survive. And the women scratched out a living in these very beautiful but not very fertile hills. And look how the buildings seem to grow out of the soil and out of the grass here. Natal, KwaZulu landscape. Look at the euphoria tree. My beautiful landscape. Not Surrey. Next. Surrey is beautiful. We were there yesterday. Um, so I was very involved in these two cultures. My mother had grown up in the wilderness of what was then southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. And um, it, the, the sense of an African wilderness was all around us. And these were of great interest to us. I'll talk more about this later. Next, please. Um, I was also very aware of you know, the, the, the shambles of life for Africans under apartheid. No one could be unaware of the politics of the situation and of this kind of life. Um, these are people who construct um, squatter villages on the outskirts. In all developing areas you find this. Barrios in Latin America, settled, um, locations here. But I sometimes use this in housing as a discussion of identity. It's all mud and all the same stuff. And you get your identity from the landscape. I live near the big rock. And that is an interesting idea for housing. Um, so I've talked about early modernism and about African culture. And this African culture is um, it's another, it's a route to my themes in architecture. And it's one that took me via Las Vegas. Um, I would claim that our architecture continues early modernism, and I make that claim in various ways. But also, this, that I have an African view of Las Vegas, and that takes a little bit of explanation. Um, I must go back to Johannesburg in the 1940s, and this was a multicultural society. First of all, Africans from across the continent came and settled in places like this. Um, but also, many, many refugees from Nazism arrived in South Africa, or from broader uh, theaters of war, um, English refugees from the Far East, for example. And so there was a, a very mixed society, and a pretty sophisticated one, too. And I had a Dutch Jewish refugee art teacher, Rosa van Gelderen, her name was. And she said, you won't be a creative artist unless you paint what's around you. Next, please. And she meant the street life of Africans in the city of Johannesburg. Here's neoclassical Johannesburg, an interesting city itself. And she liked us to paint things like that. Um, next. But I found myself getting interested not only in the work of, say, German refugees who were Impressionist painters, basically, or kind of post-Impressionist painters, and they took on African themes. And that was interesting. But what about the Africans who used old paraffin cans and produced uh, an American car? And then all the people in the car are covered in traditional African beadwork or horror of horrors to the pedants, instead of covering a gourd with beadwork, which was the standard, covering a Coca-Cola bottle. Well, I kind of liked the Coca-Cola bottle. Um, 
So there was an agonized side to the multiculturalism, and no one wants to paint over that. It was dreadful. But there was this other side, too. And there were very challenging questions, too, about us, because my education was much like yours growing up in England. I had English school teachers. Our textbooks were English. The children's books I read were the Richard stories, uh, the William stories by Richmond Crompton, Swallows and Amazons by Arthur Ransom. There I was in the Lake District and living on the felt. Um, I saw pictures of um, French West African children reciting lessons about nos ancêtres les Gaulois our ancestors, the Gauls. How ridiculous can you get if you're a little black child? Well, they tell me they don't do that now in French schools. You know, French has the same curriculum wherever. The lycée teaches the same thing. But they do make allowances for the fact that these kids are Francophone, but they're not really French. Um, and so the, these were the issues that concerned me. Um, and for example, in the school I went to, we made Christmas cards. Now, here's a little Jewish girl making Christmas cards, which is anomalies. All children, Muslim children, Jewish children, face that kind of anomaly wherever. But here, Christmas was the summer, and we were painting snow scenes in Surrey. Um, and then um, that, to me, there's one other story like that, um, watching English visitors and see, Eng English culture dominated in that sense, and to be English was to be socially elevated. You could have had no, no, ti no life at all in England, and you got to America, or rather you got to South Africa, you could put on airs, and they did. And so it, 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 was, it was good to be English in that sense. And I remember hearing a couple of English people, and they were looking at this beautiful high felt outside Johannesburg, which I found exquisite. And they looked like this, and they said, well, if you just look here, there, it could be a little piece of Surrey. And I say, well, why does it have to look like Surrey to be beautiful? Well, I was right into our thesis for Las Vegas. The everyday architecture had to be respected and understood. And I started that when I was nine or ten. And the tension was between is and ought. The English culture was saying, you ought to like this kind of landscape. And I was saying, here is the landscape we have. What's wrong with that? So is and ought was a polarity that started for me then. Um, and, and then the question then becomes, what should be there? Well, I would have said some adaptation of the South African landscape um, is appropriate. There's a, an, a South African author, Dan Jacobson, and he wrote a prelude to, um, a preface to the story of an African farm by Olive Schreiner. And he suggested that for him, the, discovering, uh, the discovery of his familiar surroundings in print was um, very strange indeed, really very strange. Um, uh, he, he read almost exclusively of English places and books. Um, but he and I lived in a harsher, drier place and found it beautiful. Um, but he talked about um, the, she actually described the lawnless, um, treeless Karoo as being beautiful. And he was living in the Karoo and he couldn't believe he was reading about his landscape in print. Well, people from Texas have told me they found, had a similar experience. Um, but, you know, in a way, I was only half right in saying you have to look at your landscape. You sure do, and you, you need to ha be at ease and reflective about it. But you need to take in other influences, too. And that's one of the reasons why we tried to tie Las Vegas to the broader history of architecture. That is Western and Eastern and Japanese and English and Italian a whole lot to make it part of a story. And that's also what Olive Schreiner did when she wrote The um, Story of an African Farm. She used literary standards current in her day in Bloomsbury. And when she did that, she made maybe the South African landscape visible for the first time because she described it in ter terms people understood. So it's a complex argument, but it's one that started 
with the clash of cultures in Africa for me. Um, as I say, Western South, uh, South African folk artists, black artists' interpretations of Western artifacts had great vitality and they prepared me also for the impurity of Las Vegas. And then in 1952, I left South Africa to work my fourth year in an office in England. Um, the war was rather recently over and um, in the earlier days you had been able to go and study the antiquities of Greece and Rome in your fourth year or work in an architect's office. Well, that had slipped out of practice at that point, the, uh, the first alternative. But I was among the first people to leave South Africa and go to England to work my first year. So um, I, I went to and started working in Frederick Gibbard's office in London. And um, I went into the AA. I'd seen AA journals in an office in South Africa. And I said to them, I, I think you produce two pantomimes a year and a lot of hot air and I'm not coming here. <laughs> and also, um, I had left a boyfriend at home, Robert Scott Brown, and I was going back to him too. And so they said, well, look, why don't you just take the entrance exam? Um, and so I did and I got in. So I was extremely surprised. You know, what, me? And then it seemed as if fate was pushing me and Robert would have to wait and I stayed and went into the final school at the AA. Now I landed in post-World War II England in the midst of the look back and anger generation. And um, what was the, I think it, that was the name of the play on, in the West End um, which depicted the society in upheaval by Kingsley Amos. And um, the stage opened, the curtains drew, and you looked at a student's flat in London. And the whole lot of us burst out laughing because it was just our lives. And being part of that kind of questioning, which was a cultural thing, which had to do with huge amount of social change. Um, the, one of my friends at the AA had the highest IQ in Luton. And he therefore got a scholarship, a major scholarship to the AA, whereas just before the war, his brother had had to leave school at the age of 14. Now that kind of social change made for big rifts within the society. The AA was cut in half. The very bright people from the government, the state schools, um, with a lot of bitterness in them, and the um, people from the public schools, the privileged ones, and then there were also the rebels from the public schools. And they formed chasms. People didn't talk to each other. And the whole place was just rift with, a rift with lifemanship. Um, juries were studies in lifemanship. I felt quite destructive at that point. Um, a faculty member would say, um, it's obvious from what you've done that you did not think of such and such. And they say, they would reply, yes, it is quite obvious from what I've done. I gave no attention to such and such. It is not important. And it would be swapping these sort of epithets rather than having a joint adventure learning about the project. So there was a lot to answer for from the Beaux-Arts School and the way juries were set up. And it moved on into modernism and it caused authoritarian personalities. And I think that's part of what Bob and I suffer from when architects view us with such alarm, that kind of authoritarian training. I, I had to take my lumps, why can't you? Um, what's wrong with you that you allow yourself the liberties that I wasn't allowed? That kind of motivation. Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, I forgot to tell you about this one. Eat your heart out, Liebeskind. <laughs> it's an African's view of the, of the high-rise buildings in the city of Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. <laughs> It's 1950s, done for tourists. There's the date on the Bulawayo train station, and that's his view of the high-rise buildings. Next. So here is what I'm talking about. Um, 
Out of this social clash came a lot of innovative social thought. The sociologists Michael Young and Peter Wilmot um, were studying London's East End. They were studying the lives of people who were forcibly moved from the East End to the new towns. Now, this was done with, with the greatest of um, goodwill. The planners thought they were really doing the very best thing, so did government, which supported it. But the very poor people who now had to live in new towns found that their networks of support, which were all informal and around them in their neighborhood, were broken. And it caused them huge hardship having to live like middle class people when they had other cultural values. And this is another theme that started with, for me, in Africa, moved through England and on into America in a very large way, saying there's nothing wrong with middle class values in many respects, but they aren't the only values. And you can't escape from your own value system, but you can certainly be aware of it, and you can be aware that there are other value systems. Well, you begin to see that um, re um, reverberating to the findings of people like Young and Wilmot were um, the Smithsons. Now, um, th there was loosely allied to the social thinkers an assemblage of avant-garde London, London artists called the Independent Group. And there was also a proto-pop art movement at the time. And um, so these were very interesting. If I liked what those Africans had been doing with their folk culture, what Paolozzi was doing, for example, in the 40s around pop art was very fascinating to me too. And here you get, it's really worth going back to Team 10 Primer and reading what they say in these texts. Some, some of them are, are really very interesting. And here were ideas of the streets in the air, which didn't work. They really didn't work, but they were really an interesting idea. They just were not used the right way. Um, later, when I learned planning, I could tell you the reasons, and we'll go into that later. These ideas of how to produce buildings that could fit in uneven bombed sites were also very fascinating. Um, so on one hand, I was taken with what the Smithsons called a whiff of the powder of the 1930s revolution, and very interested in um, linear cities, for example, and that whole great brave new society and the excitement of that feeling after World War I. On the other hand, I was also learning that some of those ideas hadn't worked, and we have to think of new ideas. And you see the Smithsons beginning to think about basically the beginnings of a linear city here. They say, why, why can we not have strips of settlement that go into the country, that, that have um, the possibility of light and air without being high-rise buildings? I think that's what that is, but that's certainly one of their ideas. Next. And here you see them again. They're the beginning of the notion that you can have access um, along which housing develops, and where the countryside is around you on either side. The Mars plan was a linear city that interested us, the ones by Le Corbusier too, and here they're trying to build community with them. Um, s many of these ideas are misplaced as to scale, but very fascinating. And then also the idea of what Peter Smithson called the new objectivity. And, um, that was probably the old German neue Sachlichkeit, which means about the same thing. Um, and it basically said um, there are moral reasons for being a functionalist, but there are also aesthetic reasons for being a functionalist, and that you should bravely follow the mandates of, of function where they take you and that if they take you to something that works extremely well and that you find incredibly ugly, live with it for a while. Um, later, Lou Kahn put it the same way. He said, you hate it and you hate it and you hate it until you love it because it's the way it's got to be. And um, someone else said, there's a small corner of heaven reserved for those who believe in morality and the arts. Well, that's that corner I'm talking about. But it's not only for moral reasons. Um, trying to love something you hate, Las Vegas, um, 
teaches you to have to get new eyes, to have to be open to a new aesthetic, to be open to the possibility of very creative other solutions, even if they shock you in the beginning. So and it doesn't mean you should go for the shocking because it's shocking, but you should entertain the possibility of the shocking. If hate it though you do, it seems to work. And that's, to me, the Neue Sachlichkeit. That's what it means for me. Um, anyway, the Smithsons became involved in the London East End. And now the is and ought that they were talking about was between middle class values and working class values, between the life of the street and um, the garden city. Um, and they called all of this also active socioplastics. And for about 10 seconds, they were involved in active socioplastics. There's a few other connections. Um, Nigel Henderson was married to someone called Judith, what was her other name? Who remembers? Anyway, she was a sociologist. So Nigel Henderson was part of the independent group. Judith Henderson was a sociologist. She taught Young and Wilmot. So Judith Henderson did. And she taught Young and Wilmot, and that's where the East End study came from. That's where this work came from. And so I think all of these connections were things that I was reverberating to. But quite soon, the Smithsons discovered, as they put it, the sociologists will have to extend themselves before they can work with architects. Well, um, what did that mean? It meant. The Smithsons couldn't speak to the sociologists, and the sociologists couldn't speak to the Smithsons. The Smithsons thought in terms of um, design and manual and graphic and object, you know, visual thinking. Um, but the Smithsons had had a verbal education, and Peter Smithson wrote extremely well. The sociologists knew zilch about art and felt even worse. Whatever the architects felt about sociology, I think the sociologists felt worse. They, 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 we can't talk to those architects. They can't think straight. We can't talk to those sociologists. They can't think straight. And no one would move for the other. My personal feeling is it's going to have to be the architects who move. And the reason is because they need the information. It's no skin off the sociologist's nose if you get your housing wrong. They'll just criticize you once you have. And also they're gadflies. They, they're very good at criticizing. They're not good at building. They can't think holistically. Very few people are trained to think holistically. We are, but we very often join up the wrong things because no one taught us to go learn about sociology before we decide to ignore it. So that's part of the story of active socioplastics. They quite soon left it and returned to a whiff of the powder of the earlier revolution and to my way of thinking, became much less relevant when they did. In, in my second year at the AA, I joined a group of students. Now, everyone was an individualist, and no one would have even have said that the Smithsons led them in this thinking. Um, but they, too, are caught, caught a whiff of the powder of the earlier revolution. And they loved the things that Le Corbusier loved, like the American grain elevators that he filched off Gropius and published himself. They then began to love the English 19th century brick factory buildings. And, but they began to turn as well toward commercial architecture, particularly if they saw a butcher shop that was in steel and glass. Now, they were a funny lot. They were very much rivals amongst themselves as well. But um, they had the term Gothic. Gothic meant everything good and everything bad. It depended on the tone of how you use it. They called each other Goths. And um, so they found a wonderful Gothic butcher shop. You see, that was a wonderful one. But this real Gothic, terrible piece of new humanism, as they called it, that came out of Sweden or out of the Festival of Britain, that was Gothic in a bad sense. Um, they were also very interested in um, the, you know, the, the early modernist um, urbanism, Ville Radieuse and the linear cities of Mill Newton and people like that. And in fact, I did with Brian Smith this thesis on, the, on Mardi, the um, Welsh mining town, which was a little linear city, but one that was placed on the ground. It was carefully on a slope of land where every house was on the ground or just one story off it. 
but it was nevertheless a linear city that went up the hill. And then later, when I took the tropical course, um, we did another linear city for um, Peru with Ernesto Paredes, who was an AA student then and has had a very interesting career in Peru. Um, he's another person to watch and see what's happened to him. Um, so we were really loyal modernists, so we were upholding the tradition, but updating it to meet post-war realities. Um, so these, these people turned to the early modern functionalist revolution, the one I identified with, and to the Neue Sachlichkeit and all of that. And um, then a little bit later, helped by Summerson, who was lecturing at the AA, and I took his course twice, they began to be interested in other people's rule breaking. First of all, they, they loved breaking the rules. If they were taught in architectural composition that you do things in threes, not in twos, they would choose to do dualities because that was against the rules. Um, later, Bob and I had a lot of fun because he also liked dualities. And another thing, everything was Cartesian, Miesian, um, um, orthogonal. We like diagonals. And diagonals were a shortcut that you could give people across a rectangle. And that was a nice thing to do for pedestrians. So long before um, the, you know, the, um, the zoot, as it got called, the pen, was popular there, we were looking at the diagonals across cathedral closes and things like that. The other rule they liked breaking was the L shape. L shape was meant to be non, you, you couldn't build it, people said. Um, they had fun looking at things you couldn't do that in fact existed and were perfectly feasible. But an L-shaped panel would uh, but meant to crack where the L bent and things like that. So that was another rule that you broke. Well, they went from that kind of rule breaking to, to mannerism, not just the, the, direct, um, the direct uncomfortable solution, also the indirect uncomfortable solution, which was exciting. Um, also, something that I learned later at Penn from people like Herb Gans, I learned here first, which is don't be too quick to judge. Don't say you can't do that. Before you look into it, make sure you really can't. It may be very useful to break that rule. When you're an urbanist, it may be even mandatory because there are so many conflicting rules. So the notion that you're a bit open uh, to changing rules, you're open to the notion that maybe the rules don't hold, you you, you eventually judge, because everyone must judge to recommend policy, to make design, but you judge a little more slowly for something that came out of this too. Um, so mannerist rule breaking was also very interesting to us. Now, if you combine mannerism and neue Sachlichkeit, it suggests that breaking aesthetic rules to meet functional requirements could produce aesthetic excitement. And that was a very important conclusion. Um, next slide. Um, pop art was another piece, as I said, of this. And um, here, this is Ian Hamilton. I couldn't find the one with the, with the um, speaking boxes, which was very important to us and later we used in our Levitan study. Um, and the American symbolism of all of this was something that people were fascinated by as well, but the Smithsons really couldn't stomach American culture much and they soon turned away from that too. Um, now, next slide. This has to st stand for a year of my time spent in Europe. Um, Robert Scott Brown had joined me and we had done this um, little course in um, the, the first year of the tropical school and um, the, we then went to work. I worked for Erno Goldfinger for six very unhappy months. Um, any resemblance to a human being, I decided, was totally superficial. Um, and then I had a nice rest and, and enjoyed myself working for Dennis Clark Hall and produced a beautiful little housing project, Robert and I working nights there, which they turned on because they said the population culturally couldn't understand the, the use of split levels. And I was outraged as a young architect. I think I would agree with them now. But the, it was still a very interesting plan. And he was a charming person to work for. Then we were married in London. We, we hitchhiked through Yugoslavia. Uh, 
I would go to that now. That was our honeymoon. And then um, we, we came back, but we, we left, and we had m g gifts of money for wedding gifts because we were very far away from home, enough to buy a three-wheeler Morgan. Now we joined the Morgan Club, which meant we had a whole other life in London as friends of London Cockneys. The Morgan Club was not a public school thing. It was full of gas mechanics, electric, electricians, um, and people our own age who became good friends. And that was a very interesting complement to all of this. And then we set off on that Morgan, hitchhiking whenever it broke down, a box of spare parts from the factory, and a lot of Italian did I learn about the insides of cars. But this, this began to teach us things. This is Campo San Barnaba. Um, this is where Catherine Hebben fell in the canal in the film she did on Venice. What was that called? I think it was called Summertime. Here is a fruit boat with its sail. Um, it's actually a sunshade and the fruit in there. And you look back to photographs of the 1920s, and that boat is still there. Um, students go across here between their residential areas and the university at the Carfoscari. Here was the antique dealer that she bought the red gla glasses from in here. I was in and out of that antique dealer. And we used to sit and have coffee here. The Communist Party headquarters was there. We once did the film, uh, filming for about a day over here. It's full of memories for me, but it also tells you of the story of functional change. These houses used over and over again by generations of people for housing, some of them in Venice going back to the 12th century. So what can you say about function and the brief if a building is going to last a 1,000 years? You can be sure it doesn't have 14th century toilets. It doesn't have the same way of life, although most of this is still housing. So it began to make me think quite hard about what does function really mean, um, if, you're, if you're thinking as an urbanist, but also as an architect. Um, going on, I was at a summer school in Venice. And um, so the summer school, we again, we did a linear city for Venice on the, at, at Mestre. Um, and that was a, a great and interesting time. And um, the architects there um, were all into their post-war issues were what they called continuita, continuity of the modern movement. How do you adapt it for post-World -war, War years? And they were very into tradition and heritage, and we felt maybe too much so. And when they did new housing, it was as if they were doing housing for peasant society still. Um, but, and they heard our um, brave new worldism, um, and it was very interesting to sit with Albini one long, long into the night, and he talked to us about what modernism had meant to him during fascism. It was a beacon of hope and sustenance for him, and it was very moving to hear that. Um, and I said, middle-aged Italians were amused by us and in sympathy with our passion, but puzzled over its focus on the jarring signs and scales of commercial and industrial architecture. They smiled ironically at what they considered a hoary technological romanticism, but I think they were remembering their own youth. And then when we got to Rome, that wedding money had run out, and we, we, we needed a job. And Ludovico Quaroni helped us find a job with a man called Giuseppe Vaccaro. And I wish I could show you a little of his work, but I can't right now. But it certainly influenced us a great deal. And he was doing industrial workers' housing more than pre-industrial society housing, we felt. And he thought in terms of systems very creatively because he adapted the different systems to go with each other. So you got a lot of variety, although... Um, he was still working in systems. So in a way, it kind of prepared me for urbanism in America. I've, I've written about that. You could find that in various books. Next, please. So we went back to South Africa just briefly. Peter Smithson had said, if you're interested in urbanism, there's only one place to study. That's where Lou Kahn is. Now, 
Harvard has their archive, the Smithson's archive. They're very disgusted because it's being cleaned up. Archivists hate that. And that was Alison Smithson. She was determined that it be um, to show Team 10 and the new brutalism in her image, not in any other kind of image. So she's really bowdlerized their archive. But it's sitting in Harvard if you want to see it. And there's about 15 years of correspondence between Lou and the Smithsons in there, apparently. So that's what he said. And why urbanism? Because this was the time of the major rebuilding in every city in Europe. So if you were a good and interested architect, you were, like Le Corbusier, designing a little house for your mother and a, th a city for three million people. Um, and that was the pattern. And so when we got back to South Africa um, to, say, to see our parents and to wait until Robert Scott Brown was old enough to miss the, the military, everyone was missing the military wherever they could, wherever I went, young people. So we didn't want to arrive and get him drafted in the American army having missed the English and the South African one. Um, but we, we went back and we spent much of a year and worked there. And we started taking pictures of street life in Johannesburg. So Rosa van Geldwin's street life and, and ours was very different. There it is, um, playing an African game at lunchtime on the sidewalks in Johannesburg. Next. And here's street life on the outskirts of Johannesburg. And think of the pictures of, um, it's, um, what's his name, Hamilton. Or is it, is it no, no, it's Henderson, I think, who took photographs of commercial um, things like uh, um, stationary kiosks with the rectangles of the, of the um, magazines, very important in the composition. Well, this is looking at blankets, which probably come from Manchester. Here is an African woman with her baby on her back, very traditional, just at the edges of Johannesburg, and she's looking at the prices of the blankets. Next. We get into signs in a big way. We're taking lots of signs. We did a great deal of photography in Europe, particularly in Venice, and a great deal of signs. These are fascinating. English tea, American Coca-Cola, Zulu shop name, but the guy who runs the, the shop is Indian. And um, there's a bicycle somewhere here, which is the most ubiquitous um, travel vehicle in African areas. And again, there's blankets from Manchester and also from Japan and also from Germany. Eastern Europe, too. So we loved this. And a beautiful structure, corrugated iron, big roof, vented, and then dark in there where you go in to buy. And there's a whole African ritual of buying. There'll be a, a, a sewing machine right there. And she'll make up the fabric that they buy into the kind of robes they wear while they wait. Next. And then we got more into the Mapach housing of northern Transvaal. And look at the street they make. And here are the huts of the children and the parents. Um, look at the finger painting on the mud walls. The, these patterns, which are very mapach, they're very structural in their patterns, but they're also influenced by Gillette razor blades. And look at the suburban house. That's a white person's house, and I think it's got a street number somewhere there. And these almost Arabic-looking you know, Arabic influence went all the way down as far as Johannesburg. You find Arabic beads buried in places just outside Johannesburg. So very fascinating urbanism. Next. More of it. This is done with your hand. Talk about the nature of the material. It's four inches, you know, which is a measure of a hand. And then there are blankets, which are typically those big striped ones. This is where the children live. Next. And this is one of my key photos. Um, this was a little house built by some Africans. You know, they have um, the whole neighborhood of Africans comes to help them do the roof, but they managed to get the wattle and door walls built. Now, this is not a round house, a rondavel as we called it, like these. This is a square house. This is called demonstration effect. They're trying to, op um, to imitate a white person's house. I think of Levittown and I think of